bring us a song, you get better. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. How many of y'all were here the last time I spoke? I was here. Okay, a number of you were here. That's good. I talked about the, uh, the 10 core principles of science of mind. Remember that? Gave you a little bit of information about all of them. Well, I've decided that's not enough, at least for the first one on the list. And the first one on the, the list, anybody remember what it was? Really? <laughs> oneness, thank you. It was oneness. The concept of oneness is the, um, is the one that we all know and very seldom practice. Not that we're trying to not do that, but it's so abstract to most people because oneness claims that there's only one thing going on. Yet you use your eyes and your ears and it looks like a lot of things are going on. So how do you reconcile that? How do you actually practice the principle of oneness? Well, I thought we'd work on that today. And I want to begin by, by pointing out that the... Uh, the whole idea of oneness, I'll be right back. The whole idea of oneness is not new. Even though our overarching philosophy is called new thought, and it isn't very old as a philosophy, it comes from ancient wisdom. So this idea of, of uh, the presence of God everywhere has some really deep roots over a long period of time. And I thought I'd, it'd be a good idea to maybe share some of that with you. So we're going to start with Jesus. Good, I see some smiles. You're okay with that. <laughs> we're going to start with this idea of, of Jesus in, a, in, in the book of John. He says, this is what's happening. He's about to be stoned to death by a group of, uh, of, of very angry uh, Israelites. And this is the conversation he has with them. He starts by saying, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Notice he didn't say my Father, he said the Father. And that comes out of the Greek translation of what he said. Uh, what he was saying is the works of source. For which, these do, for which of these do you stone me? Isn't that amazing to have that level of composure when people are coming at you with rocks? <laughs> and they answer him and they say, we are not stoned stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. In their moment of puzzlement and not remembering that, he escaped. <laughs> Smart guy. He was saying, you are gods. So you, you claim that I am a mere man, but claim I am God, and I'm telling you that you are God's. So where'd he get that? Does it not, is it not written in your law? Where'd he get that? It's actually in the Psalms. It's in the Psalms. In fact, this is it. Uh, chapter 82, verse 6 says, I say you are God's. You are all children of the Most High. So... When were the Psalms written? You know, some people give King David uh, credit for the Psalms. Probably not. But it was written that far back, many thousands of years ago. And of course, you can go into uh, Greek and Roman mythology and Norse myth mythology, and we talk about all these gods, but there's always a godhead. There's some chief god. And then inevitably the gods somehow have children with mortals, so then you've got demigods, and you got all this stuff going on. So the idea wasn't that original in, in the Judeo-Christian religion, but it's still there. It's still saying that we are all that divine presence, and we are. So maybe a new thought concept, because you will not hear this in any other uh, uh, Jewish or Christian environments that I've ever known of. Even though it is in scripture, you won't hear about it. At the same time, ours, ours, which is called New Thought, founds its very existence on this notion that God is at the center of all, without exception. So this is Thomas Troward. 
Troward was the, uh, before, you know, you're going to try to read that, so I'm going to hold it off for a second because I, I want you to listen to me. <laughs> Thomas Troward was, uh, was a man who became a judge in the British court system in India. He was raised in India. His parents were British, but he grew up in India, in the Punjab, where the, the Sikh people live. And if you know anything about Sikhism, it's quite a masterful uh, uh, Discipline. In fact, the word Sikh means disciple or learner or follower. And what they follow is very, very rigid. They are often called the warriors uh, of the Hindu sects. And they are quite an amazing people. You've seen them. They wear, they wear very distinct turbans and they are uh, very disciplined people. And that's where Troar grew up. So his Hindu uh, understandings came out of that. When he retired as a judge, he moved back to Great Britain. And, uh, and began to lecture on, on the way he perceived the world through what he learned in India. And actually was the founder of, of the New Thought Movement, as best we can tell. He was the first president of the International New Thought Alliance, which still exists. In fact, Barbara and I are speaking at the 103rd Congress of the International New Thought Alliance, INTA, uh, this summer. And, we'll, and when it gets closer, we'll invite you to go with us because it's going to be over in Nashville. So I know it hasn't been on the East Coast in a long time. It started in England. It ended up in, in Arizona. And but we're going to have our, our 103rd Congress very close by. So that's what's happening. Thomas Troward. So this is what Troward said that is so profoundly in alignment with this idea of oneness. He takes it to a, to a higher step. Watch this. Because spirit is infinite or limitless, spirit is everywhere. And therefore it follows that the whole of spirit must be present at every point in space at the same time. Let me translate. Spirit is present at the point of you in its entirety. Infinitely present at the point of you. You are not a point of spirit. You are all of spirit. And so am I. That takes some work to absorb that, to digest that. But that's what it means. It means that the creative essence of the universe dwells at the point of you. And you'll wonder why they said that Jesus was being uh, uh, blasphemy. This is pretty radical. But if you think about it, if God is truly infinite and omnipresent, then it must be present everywhere, all the time, always, in its entirety, whole and complete, without exception. It must. Okay, so that really sets the new thought stage for where we are. And of course, Holmes, in our Declaration of Principles, was very clear about this. So the first three uh, sentences of the uh, Declaration of Principles go like this. We believe in God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. Notice he never says that God is a he, or a guy, or a person, or an entity, because God isn't those things. God is cause. So remember what we said about the, all of God is, is at the point of you? That must mean your cause. You're causing everything in your life to happen all the time without exception. We want to blame things outside of us. That's where we fall short. We want to say it's happening because of him or her or that or, or that all, whatever's happening. That's the problem. No, 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 no. It's not how it works. It works because the God is complete and whole at the point of you. You are creating your experience, beginning and end. You're creating everything that you express out, and you're creating everything that's coming back to you. Yes, it moves through the law, but it's still you. Nothing happens without you initiating it. Nothing. This one manifests itself in and through all creation, meaning not just you, but all creation. And this is the really cool part, but it is not absorbed by its creation. Meaning that there's nothing in the physical universe to worship. Because it's all God. And, and it's not, and God is not absorbed, meaning God is, is there in some way more than it is there. It's the same. So God is in the sublime and the mundane simultaneously in its completeness. In everything. Everything is God. Everything. But not just everything, because like Troward and uh, the Sikhs, uh, the experience of that is, uh, is called penentheism, 
which means, those of you that have been in class recently have heard these terms again, panentheism means that everything is contained within the divine presence. But that the divine presence is bigger than everything. It is more than everything. But even that moreness is at the point of view. Because you're not a thing. You're the divine presence. So that moreness applies to you. That's why in the circle this morning, I think my word was more. Because there's always more. There's more to understand. Also, some people have this idea that spirit is growing and expanding. I absolutely believe that the universe is growing and expanding. But the universe is not what God is exclusively. Meaning that God is more than the universe. So if the universe is expanding, that's great. That means physical form is expanding. And my guess is the way we can explain that is that everything's expanding in physical form. So we don't notice it because we're all expanding at the same time. As the, as, as the edges of the universe, whatever that means, is expanding, so are we in physical form. Now, we are becoming more aware of our divine nature. That's why we come to a place like this. That's why we do this work. Because we want to understand this principle and we want to apply it to our lives. At least that's why I'm here. And I would imagine most of you are here for the same reason. Some of you may be here for the soup. I don't know. <clears throat> But the great gift that this teaching gives us is that idea that that which is perfect, whole, and complete in every way is the essence of who we are. And we cannot be separated from it. It can't be there sometimes and not be there sometimes. That just doesn't work. It's always there. What isn't always there is our awareness of it and our willingness to accept it and live by that understanding. That's where it falls a little bit short. This last part. The manifest universe is the body of God. It is the logical and necessary outcome of the infinite knowingness of God. So Holmes says that the universe is the body of God. The same way you have a body. Are you your body? No, you're so much more than your body. You're able to influence your body with your thinking. Are you your mind? No, you're not your mind. You use your mind as a tool to move through life, to perceive things, and to create things. It's your tool, but it's not who you are. What you are is pure spirit, absolute and eternal, always, without exception. That's the truth of who you are. Everybody know this guy? I've always had a connection to Sai Baba, and I was very unhappy with him when he transitioned in 2011. Because I had big plans to go visit with him. And it didn't happen, at least in this lifetime. But who knows? Maybe I'll live long enough for his next incarnation to show up and, and I'll maybe go have a chat with a little boy. Wouldn't that be nice? Or a girl. Why not? Anything could work. Any, it's all perfect. Anyway, I, I, with that connection with, with uh, Sai Baba, um, I had a, there was a gentleman downtown that uh, has been a friend for many, many years uh, who was a devotee. And uh, he owned a shop downtown at one time. And we went in there and somehow, well, he had just gotten back from India and being with Sai Baba. And he brought out this little dish of vabuti. Everybody heard of vabuti? It's, it's also called holy ash. It looks like ash. But if you smell it or taste it, it's very sweet. And the way it, it exists is that Sai Baba would just move his hands like this over a container and ash would come out. This, this fabuti would come out and it would fill large containers. I heard that they had 55-gallon drums of this stuff. Of course, they don't have it anymore because he's not in physical form any, right now. But he would do that and, and then it would be gifted to people that would come. And, uh, some, and, and so this friend of mine actually gave me some fabuti. Uh, he gave me some the day I was in his, in his shop downtown. In fact, he gave Barbara and I both some. He brought it out, took a little spoon, and put a little tiny bit in both of our hands, a little, little pile of ash. And I looked at him, and I said, what do I do with this? He said, eat it. <laughs> okay. So I did. It was all caught up in the taste of it. It was fascinating. Ash generally doesn't taste very good. But this was actually interesting. And so I'm standing there and we're talking more. And at some point I looked back down into my hand and there was a pile of a booty there. Huh? Yeah. So I knew what to do with it this time. 
So I put it in my mouth, and then I watched my hand. <laughs> I didn't get another, another pile of it. But he did give me some babuti, and I had this lovely little wooden carved box that I kept it in. And on very rare occasions, I would pull it out and share it with somebody really special. And it was this lovely experience. And then in 2011, he made his transition. And it was somewhat unexpected because he had predicted his death, but apparently he was using some ancient calendar uh, that, that wasn't what we all use, so it was misinterpreted. They thought he was going to be around for another 20 years. But he was gone, and he actually made his transition on, on the same week that Osama bin Laden died, was captured and killed by our troops. And so one Sunday morning, I, I shared the story of these two very different men. And somebody that I didn't know was so unhappy that I talked about Osama bin Laden that he got up and walked out. Because he missed a great story. And the story was obviously that this man, Sai Baba, had, had done incredible things in the world. Yes, he did things that looked like tricks with the vabuti, or he would just hold his hand out and we, he would have a ring or a watch or a piece of jewelry to give to someone who had come to visit with him. And uh, someone once asked him, was, how did he create that out of nothing? And he said, well, he has a warehouse of that stuff several miles from here, but he doesn't ever go there. He just has it. He was known for bilocating. He was something that he did. He was actually getting a shave by a barber one day and he was all lathered up and he's getting this shave and the, the barber's very upset and, and, the, and uh, uh, Sai Baba says, what's wrong? He said, I miss my son and I call him and he won't return my calls and he, he won't come visit me. And Sai Baba says, wait a minute, because he was prone to dramatic uh, outbursts and he ran out of the, out of the room. And a couple of minutes later, he walked back in and sat down. I was like, he said, okay, continue. The next day, the barber's son called him and said, I'm coming to see you. And the, the barber said, wow, what happened? Well, how is that so? He said, yesterday, some crazy man with shaving cream all over his face ran into my shop and said, you go see your father. <laughs> and this was like hundreds of miles away. <clears throat> yeah, I know. So... Obviously, he could do these things. So the interesting thing about Sai Baba and what I'm sharing with you about oneness is that someone once asked him, how is it that you can do all these miracles, all these bizarre things that, we, that, that other people can't do? And he laughed. And he said, well, the difference between you and me is that you think you're God. And I know I'm God. And I act that way. Oh, there's more than we're doing. So as we think we are God, as we come to this place, this new thought center, this science of mind center, and we keep being told over and over again that the presence of the divine dwells at the point of you, we still have to act like it or we're just thinking it so instead of knowing it so. And if you look at your life, I would be willing to bet that every single one of us has had moments in our lives where we were so clear and so knowing of the truth of our being that we did manifest something out of nothing, just like Sai Baba. And then we forget because the problem looks so big. The challenge looks so overwhelming. And we fall back into that trap of not remembering. I believe that when we're not in bodies that we remember all the time. I think we're totally cognizant of who we are when we don't, we're not in this three-dimensional form of having bodies. But when we are in these bodies, it's so easy to not see it and not know it and not live according to it. To think somehow that something has some control over us, that we are somehow oppressed by life. And there are things that have control over our bodies to a degree, I have never seen a human being without a jetpack jet just fly off into the air. Yeah, I know, Superman. But the truth is that that's not a reality. Yet we create these things called jet planes, and they will zoom through the air faster than, than, than anything. It's quite amazing what we can do with technology. So we use our mind, and we create something that does that for us. But we still have the laws of nature. We're still dealing with that at a physical level. So the trick here is... Remember, you're not your body. 
that the physical laws that have some say over how your body works is not who you are. You're the one behind the curtain. You're the one that's invisible. You're the one that's right there by your body, but is not your body. You're something greater than that, that you think you are. I am something greater than I think I am. And this is our opportunity with this extraordinary treat, uh, uh, teaching to actually look at this again and again and get further along. The way I was complimenting Jennifer on how every time she sings a song, it's more beautiful than the last one she sang. Every time we have a thought, it should be more clear than the last one we had to know the truth of who we are and to somehow separate ourselves from the conditions that we think are running our lives because they're not. We are. We are by what we think and what we say and what we do. That's what guides our lives. We think it's something out there, it's not. It's right at the point of us. Thank you, Sai Baba, for your clarity. At some point, we're, our paths will cross, I assure you. Here's more from the, science of, from the Declaration of Principles. We believe that heaven is within us and that we experience to the degree that we become conscious of it. We experience it to the degree that we become conscious of it, meaning that that euphoria of life is always there it doesn't go away. God's love doesn't go away. There's always love. We live in a sea of love. It doesn't leave. The question is, do we, are we aware of it? And do we act on that awareness? Maybe, but likely not at times. We believe the ultimate goal of life is to be, to be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. That is big. All discord, gone. There's names for that. Nirvana, utopia, heaven. It's available to us right now. Now, I'm not going to suggest that every single one of us is always going to do that. He says that. And, and I, I'll go with the fact that that's where our species is, is going. That's where we want to be. Still the challenges come, things happen, and we give some kind of power to that. And all it does is it takes the power away from us. So the idea is that when something comes up and it runs through the filters of your mind, and the first thing you hear is that this is a problem, this is bad, is not to buy into it, is not to, not to agree. It's so easy to agree that that's what's going on. And that's so not true. It's so a lie that we tell ourselves that somehow this stuff is happening to us. It's happening because of us. Which means that if God is in the midst of all of it, that we can't be looking at some things as good and some things as bad. Holmes loved the word good. And I've always thought, you know, if, if, if he's calling good, that must mean there's a bad. But he's saying there's no bad. Yes, there's stuff we don't like. Okay, understandable. There are things happening in the world that we want nothing to do with, that we don't want to experience. And, but the trick is don't buy into it as bad. Because as soon as you do that, you separate yourself from it and you give it power to control your affect. You've given away who you are to this thing that is just as much God as everything else. And you can pick the hard stuff too. The question that often comes up in class, what about the Holocaust? Wasn't that bad? Well, you could look at it that way. Most people do. And I'm not going to tell you that, that it's a delightful experience that all these people were murdered in Nazi Germany. But what I find in it is God. And the God I find in it are those amazing people who gave up their bodies so that we could learn not to ever do that again. What a gift to humanity. What an extraordinary thing. Now, I'm not suggesting they said, okay, in their, while they were in their physical form on planet Earth, they said, okay, I'll go die so that we can fix this in our species. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised that there was agreement long before all those people incarnated into their lives as Jews in Germany that they all agreed to do that. 
Does that let the uh, Gestapo and the leaders of the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler, does that let them off the hook? No, all that stuff comes with karma. But they were playing their role in the same process of making sure we never do this again. That we do learn to honor life. That we do learn to fill our lives with joy and peace and love. And let that be where our focus is all the time. And when we do, we get that life. And sometimes, as a human species, we have to learn things the hard way. Maybe not so much anymore. The last one here is we believe in the unity of all life and that the highest God and the innermost God is the same God. No difference. The same exact spirit. No difference. So that when Troward says that this that dwells within you is whole and complete and infinite at the point of view, it is. It is. And it's whole and complete and infinite at the point of the one sitting next to you. And the, one, the last one you had an argument with. And the person that you think cheated you. And the person that made you wrong. And the person you just didn't understand. And the person that you would cross the street to not have a conversation with. God dwells infinitely at the point of them too. Now what we can learn from that is not to be afraid. Not to be afraid. No matter what. Because God's in the midst of it. Has to be. Without exception. That's what God is. God is us. And we are the source of our lives. Because of that. Another one from Troward. Belief in limitation is the one and only thing that causes limitation. Isn't that brilliant? So if you have a limitation in your life, it's your belief in it that makes it real. It's not real. It's not. There are no limitations except those we impose upon ourselves. So we can have whatever life we want. And that's the point of what I'm sharing with you today. The pragmatic point of all this is that you're in charge. You're in charge of your life. And when you go, I don't know, that's a lie because at some, in some way inside of you, you do know. There's nothing outside of you. There is nothing outside of you because the infinite presence is at the point of view. What more could there be? More mind? You think there's more mind somebody, somewhere else? Obviously, the way our brains are structured, we tend to think one thought at a time, even if we think tens of thousands of them in a day, we tend to think of them one at a time. That's sort of the way we're wired in this human experience. But there's no information that's kept from us. We have access to everything and anything. We have intuition, which is what Holmes called it, to know the truth of who we are. And the place to start anytime you think you don't know is to say to yourself, yes, I do. I do know. I know who I am, and I know what needs to be done. You'd be amazed how many people I do treatment for that say, when, when I talk to them about what we're going to do a treatment around, prayer around, is that they, they want to know that they'll make the right decision. And I tell them they can't make a wrong decision. They can make a decision that they don't want to stick with when it, when it manifests. They could choose something and go, okay, that is not really what I want. But all they have to do is choose something else. It's really that easy. Oh, yeah, but I told people I would do it. Well, change your agreements. It's all workable. There's nothing that binds us to anything in our life but our own thinking. And that's the essence of it. Limitation. Anything that seems like a limitation is created only by our own belief in that limitation. There is nothing else. So what do we do with this? I'm telling you your own source. So... Why do you come into a room like this? Why do you talk to practitioners? Why, why, do you, why do we recommend that? Well, because it's nice to get someone to help us let, be clear. But let me tell you about working with a practitioner. What they're giving you when they do a treatment with you is they're lending you their consciousness. They're lending you their consciousness, saying they know the truth about you better than you do. So in this moment, they're going to know that this limitation is gone and that something wonderful is progressing in your life. According to your desire, they will know it. And guess what? It will show up in your life. 
But here's the deal. If you don't change your limited thinking, you're going to go back to where you were. One of my ministers down in Florida was at an event one day uh, that I was at. It was with a man named Willard Fuller. And the day that Willard came, he was known as a tooth or a, a, a oral healer. He would lay hands on and do a blessing on everybody and call the name of Jesus. And you would have things happen. Not everybody, but a lot of people would have things happen in their mouths. I had three fillings show up out of nowhere. Now, do I think that Willard Fuller did that? No, I'm source of my life. I did that. If you've ever gone to a healer of any sort and you think they did something, all they did was facilitate you dropping the belief that isn't working in your life so that you could have the healing that you've been wanting all along. But they didn't do it. That's not how it works. You did it. You're the source of your life. I was speaking about a minister that was there the day that, that I had these three fillings show up on my mouth. His fillings turned from an amalgam to gold. Yay! That was his thought. And every morning he would go and look in the mirror and go, huh, still there. I don't know, about nine months later, one morning he got up and went in the mirror and looked, and they'd all turn back. And his first words were, I knew that was going to happen. Do we not create our experience? Now, we don't do it all consciously, but we do it. One way we do it is having a fear that something's not going to work. Having a fear about something not working is like wearing a neon sign that says, kick me. Don't do that to yourself. Don't anticipate failure because failure will be the outcome that you receive if that's where you play. Do it differently. And do work with practitioners. The reason that these people can treat with you and have a condition change in your life is that they don't, they're not buying it into your BS, your belief system. <laughs> they have a clear belief system that allows them to know the truth about you no matter what. And what I teach them when, I, when I'm in prac one, two with them, what, what I teach them is you nod your head and you listen to the story about how things aren't working and all that. And you're thinking the whole time, this is God trying to trick me. And I'm not buying it. And you love them and you know the truth for them, even when they can't know it for themselves. So go to a practitioner. They are great for cracking that orb open and letting that light out. But then it's up to you because you're the source. You're the source of your life. You always will be. That's the truth of you, the greatest and highest truth of you and of me. And when we get it and we do what Holmes said, our lives will be changed forever and the human species will have a new way of being on planet Earth. Are you up to it? Let's give it a go. Because you are the source and I love you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm not coming down. I get to stay up here. <sighs> Breathe. <sighs> so I'm wondering if we have anyone in the room for the very first time today. Never been here before. Anyone here for the first time? Would you raise your hand? Just let us say hi. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for being with us. We're delighted that you're here. Thank you. Everybody else been here before? Fantastic. That's wonderful. We're really glad that, you're, that you've come back. Some of you uh, are, are, have just been coming a short time. Oh, we got another one there. Thank you so much for being with us. We're really glad. Uh, Alice, we, the, this young lady up here on the front uh, is here for the first time. I also want to comment that uh, Nancy and Lance and Logan, who have not been here for years, are here. Stand up, guys. Remember these people? Lance and Logan were much smaller, and I used to pick them up and spin them around. Which one of you did that to me this morning? Yeah, okay. That's called karma. <laughs> and by the way, you have good consciousness because in the last few months, I've dropped 40 pounds, so you had less to have to lift. Good for you. Good for you. 
Thank you all for being with us here this morning. We have a gift for you out in, out in our Welcome Center, and uh, we are delighted that you have found your way to be with us. Isn't this wonderful? So now I would like to invite our prosperity acceptors to come forward. And if you would, take out what you're going to give today. And I've got a check from Barbara and me, and a check that came in the mail that is unidentified because I haven't opened the envelope. I believe that money is God in action. That money is that dynamic flow of spirit. It's something that we use to generate energy in our lives. It's an agreement. And it actually works. All of us have it. All of us use it. And with these principles that we're teaching, we can use it better. And one thing we can do is we can be so glad that we have a place like this where we can know the truth. So I invite you to take whatever it is you're giving today and hold it close to your heart. Just so you remember that love's involved in every bit of this. And to remember that that divine present that we have spoken of all day today, that we speak of so much at this place, is active right now in this giving process. Because we can't outgive God. We can only continue to move that energy through our lives and watch it grow knowing that all is well and all is God. And with a certainty that that is so, let's say these words together aloud. I freely and joyously give from the abundance and fullness of my overflowing wealth, knowing my gift goes with love as it touches and blesses the world. And so it is.